Thank you, Judge President. This is a summarized version of my judgment. This appeal, consolidating two others, marks the first time in the history of the Supreme Court of Kenya to determine the remit of constitutional amendment through a popular initiative and Article 257 of the Constitution. The road traveled by Kenyans since 1991 in search of a new constitution, culminating in the 2010 document, has been sinuous and meandering. A road characterized by violent demonstrations, protests, mass actions, and even loss of life. Like the biblical narrow road which leadeth unto life, it was the way, the only way to a new beginning. And so at 10.26 a.m. on Friday 27th, August 2010, with a single stroke of his pen, President Mwai Kibaki endorsed the draft constitution and there was a dawn of a new era. Before an ecstatic Kenyan people and as cannons broke into a 21-gun salute, the president released two white doves as a sign of peace, love, hope, marking the birth of the Second Republic. Having emerged from this phase, Kenya embarked on building constitutionalism, giving meaning to the terms and values of the supreme law to which Kenyans must turn must turn to for protection in times of need. It was time for the people to read meaning into its words. It's only through this robust enforcement, application, and interpretation by courageous citizens, lawyers, legislature, executive, and even more so by judges, that the Constitution will be safeguarded to realize the Kenyan dream contained in the preamble. The jurist, um, and so, with the difficult history of constitutional making enumerated in the lead judgment of, of the Honorable the Chief Justice, the question I pose, have the Kenyan people stayed true to the promise in the preamble that we, the people of Kenya, adopt, enact, and give this constitution to ourselves and to our future generations? So there were seven issues that were framed, uh, the first one being um, that on basic structure doctrine, and that's the one I now turn to. In the last 50 years, since the Supreme Court of India decided Kasavananda case, the name Kasavananda has been synonymous with the basic structure doctrine, and although the term basic structure has not been used, has has been used in a few cases in this country in the past. It is during the hearing of this case from the High Court through to this court that it became a household name. I suppose knowing Kenyans in our true unique sense, there may be children today who are called basic structure. Perhaps basic structure George Ochola. <laughs> Just as there may be also in India children born in the 1970s who are given the name Kasavananda after the Hindu spiritual leader who lent his name to the iconic case as the petitioner. Unfortunately, I believe you are all aware Mr. Kasavananda passed on on the 6th September 2020 at the age of 79 years. The origin of basic structure doctrine has largely been attributed to the Indian Supreme Court decision in Kesavananda, with very little or no acknowledgement at all of Professor Conrad's contribution. Yet it is this German scholar who exported it to India. Professor Conrad's theory, which was applied in Kesavananda, postulates that there are implied limits on the power of parliament to amend certain protected provisions of the Constitution called the Basic Structure. Under Article 368 of the Constitution of India, it is Parliament and Parliament alone that is reposed of the power to amend the Constitution. 
and indeed close clauses four and five even explicitly limits the power of the courts to review any act of parliament to amend the constitution. No amendment of the constitution made by parliament pursuant to the provisions of the constitution can be called in question in any court in India on any ground. However, in construing Article 368 and the limitations on the powers of the court to question the power of parliament, notwithstanding, the Supreme Court in Casavenanda held that although the article donates exclusive power to parliament to amend any provision of the constitution in accordance with the procedure in that article, the powers could not be used to damage, emasculate, destroy, abrogate, change, or alter the basic structure or the framework of the constitution. The theory was itself influenced by the German's political and constitutional history. Under Article 76 of the German's original constitution, called the Weimar Constitution, Parliament had the power to amend the Constitution with the procedural constraint restraints that required two-thirds votes of the members of its Parliament to pass an amendment. Adolf Hitler, that well-known but reviled figure in history, used this same procedure, a procedure which is anchored in the Constitution, effortlessly to overhaul the entire Weimar Constitution and arbitrarily took away rights to freedoms of speech, expression, association, and habeas corpus. He then declared a state of emergency. This experience was to inform Germans constitutional reforms in their new constitution, the Grand Gazette, the Basic Law. Substantive limits have been introduced to the amending power of parliament. Article 79 of the Basic Law explicitly bars any amendment to the provisions concerning the basic principles like federal, federalism, democracy, rule of law, separation of powers. Our own history is equally replete with examples and instances that led to agitation for constitutional reforms as the former constitution was in no better ranking than the Indian or the Wema constitutions. The former constitution provided for its alteration as opposed to amendment under section 47 and vested wholly the power to amend it in parliament, a common denominator with the Indian and the Wema constitutions. Our parliament under section 47, like parliaments of the two nations, could indiscriminately change and did in fact change the constitution at will in any manner whatsoever without reference to the people. The history of agit agitation to reverse the trend and save the constitution leading to the promulgation of the 2010 constitution is well known and are chronicled in details in my main judgment. But why is this history important. Just like India and Germany, where the seed of, of basic structure doctrine was planted, it is their unique history that influenced the path of constitutional reforms and the decision of the courts in those jurisdictions in applying the doctrine. Constitutions the world over reflect the uniqueness and spe spe specificity of each society even if lessons or experiences can be drawn from those places. In the Kenyan situation, drawing from the past, informed by the present, and focusing on the future, the 2010 Constitution has set up a framework which returns Kenya to the path of democratization. Parliament cannot be used to pass amendments to the Constitution in the manner it did before 2010 because of the current inbuilt mechanisms and safeguards, as well as the complex and elaborate procedures in the Constitution itself. The situation the Supreme Court of India was addressing in Kesavananda is unique to India, based on the specific provisions of the Indian Constitution. 
Article 368, to be exact, their experience and also based on their history generally. Therefore, in relying on Casavananda, Hook, Line, and Sinka to address the peculiar circumstances of Kenya, the superior courts below ought to have exercised caution and followed the guidelines repeatedly emphasized by this court in various cases, judges and magistrates rating board and the Rai case. Courts ought to avoid mechanistic approaches to president because it is inappropriate to pick a president all over the world simply because they appear to provide an answer to a matter at hand. Each of those presidents has its place in the jurisprudence of its own country of origin. There was justification to rely on Casavananda in interpreting section 47 of the former constitution in the Njoya case because at the time our constitutional framework was more or less similar to Article 368 of the Indian Constitution in the sense that the power to amend the Constitution reposed in Parliament and Parliament alone. But this is no longer the case in Kenya. Throughout the constitutional making process from the BOMAS draft, the WACO draft, the revised harmonized draft, and the proposed draft Constitution, it has, it has been made abundantly clear that since the Constitution embodies the will and aspirations of the people, they must be central to its amendment, and that there, are, there ought to be a balance to have a Constitution that is flexible enough for posterity and unforeseen needs, but rigid enough to prevent the, abuse, the abusive hyper-amendments of, of yesteryears. This balance was achieved by clear, unambiguous, and distinct tiered or multi-stage design model modified, codified in chapter 16, applying different procedures of amendment for different provisions of the constitution. Specifically, amendment process of any matters in article 255.1 is complex and onerous. It requires support of one million voters, requires the promoters to draft a bill, which then must be verified by the IEBC and finally, sorry, and approval by the county assemblies and parliament meeting a certain threshold and finally ratified in a referendum. Attempts to utilize both parliamentary and popular initi initiatives have failed essentially because of the tiered or multi-stage design of ch chapter 16. You remember the Okoa Kenya bill 2016 Punguza Mizigo Bill of 2019. To this extent, even the two courts below agree that Article 251 embodies the basic structure of the Constitution of Kenya. For me, the most difficult part of the two judgments of the two courts below and the dilemma flowing from them is the imprecise scope and the extent of basic structure doctrine. Which provision in the Constitution in Ke of Kenya, for, in for instance, are not amendable through the procedure in Chapter 16? What does it mean, for instance, when the High Court and the Court of Appeal accept, on the one hand, that all, um, all articles in the Constitution are amendable in accordance with the constitutional procedures provided, but on the other, qualifies the statement by declaring that basic structure of that very constitution cannot be altered using the amendment power in the constitution. What does it mean when they declare that the basic structure cons consists of the preamble, the 18 chapters, the 16 schedules? Is it the constitution is in entirety as a basic structure? Where do Kenyans who wish to propose amendments to the Constitution go to be shown which provisions cannot be amended using Chapter 16 procedure? Do they go to some deity, some oracle of Delphi, for instance? The interpreting, in interpreting 
the Constitution, courts must provide pragmatic solutions without adding confusion to the controversy that the parties have brought to them for resolution in the first place. Amending the Constitution is not a light matter, therefore limitations to its amendment must sufficiently be specific and unambiguous. In India today, because of the nebulous nature of implied limitations to constitutional amendment since Casavananda case, every court has attempted to identify by listing some of the essential structural elements of the constitution that in their individual perceptions constitute the basic structure of the Indian constitution on a case-to-case -case basis. Chapter 16 exhaustively sets out the process of initiating an amendment to the, to the protected provisions. Of course, that process includes public participation and a referendum. That is in, in, in answer to the question of where is the juridical basis in the Kenyan context for the proposition by the two courts that the basic structure um, of the Constitution can only be amended through primary constituent power, which must include four sequential processes, namely civic education, public participation, and coalition of views, constituent assembly, a debate, and ultimately a referendum. The last matter under this ground is to consider the unanimous conclusion by both superior courts below that the proposed amendments in the draft bill amounted to dismemberment of the Constitution. Besides the number of articles sought to be amended, the courts were concerned about the overall effect, that they were so far reaching in character, scope, and content as to, and I quote, shake the foundation and alter the identity and character of the Constitution as to effectively dismember it. The learned judges variously defined the word dismemberment to mean doing any of the following in the Constitution. Unmaking, replacing, disassemble, completely change identity, abolish, tear apart, amputate, and rough mutilation. Do the proposals in the amendment a draft bill create a new constitution? Do the verbs and make, replace, disassemble, completely change identity, abolish, tear apart, amputate, employed by the learned judges to describe the proposals in the bill and to suggest that the proposals were, dis were a dis dismemberment of the constitution, are they are they so? In my most respectful view, these words were an overkill, and the sledgehammer employed to deal with them was in itself disproportionate. <coughs> I end this ground where I started. However great, however progressive a written constitution may be, history, experiences, and changes in society would necessitate corresponding changes to the, written con to the written text of the Constitution, with each generation having the right and freedom to determine the law under which they wish to live. And no generation should bind the course, aspirations, constitutional expectations, values, principles, and object objects of generations to come. The language of chapter 16 is clear and plain, leaving no room for conjecture, inference, or implication. Neither the explicit nor the implicit language of the Constitution, the history of constitutional making, or any principle of constitutional interpretation in this country permits the courts to do what the courts have accused previous parliaments of perpetuating, that is to undertake indiscriminate and radical amendments to the Constitution by imposing an alien method of amending it. In the result, I would set aside the judgment of the Court of Appeal and hold that to the extent 
that the basic structure doctrine limits the amendment power contrary to the express terms of Chapter 16 of the Constitution, it does not apply to the Constitution of Kenya. And that there are no four sequential steps for the amendment of the Constitution other than the steps outlined in Chapter 16. The second issue is on the role of the President in the process. This question to me, and of course the question of basic structure doctrine, are the real norms of this dispute. This particular question seeks to answer the issue of legality, legitimacy, and constitutionality of the process leading to the formulation of the draft bill based on the true construction of Article 257. The High Court was persuaded and declared that the President does not have authority under the Constitution to initiate changes to, by way of amendment. That a constitutional amendment can only be initiated either by Parliament through parliamentary initiative under Article 256 or by a popular initiative under 257. The Court of Appeal, in a unanimous decision, agreed and affirmed that conclusion. Friday afternoon, March 9th, 2018, which was the same day the justices of the Court of Appeal elected me as their president at Safari Park Hotel, will be remembered as one of the many defining moments in the history of Kenya. It was on that day that in a move that took many by surprise, the president and his political opponent, Honorable Odinga, with whom he had recently engaged in fiercest and bare knuckle political contest, met and agreed in what has come to be known as the handshake to end their political rivalry that had been witnessed in the previous elections. The last political contest between the two was so fierce that at the end of it, both laid claim to the presidency. It has been argued that the President and Honorable Odinga, both well-meaning, intended to ease this, the seething tension and restore peace, unity, and tranquility in the country. To realize this objective and as an understanding of the handshake, the two agreed to pursue a nine-point agenda styled the Building Bridges Initiative or BBI. A series of events followed, and we, I trace these events to mark out the role of the president in the process. By a Gazette notice of 31st May 2018, the president appointed a 14-member team known as the Task Force on Building Bridges to United um, Advisory. By a subsequent special gazette notice of 10th January 2020, the steering committee on the implementation of building bridges to a United Kenya task force report was also established, and as the name suggests, to implement the report of the task force. Of interest, one of its mandate was to propose administrative policy of constitutional changes that may be necessary. The steering committee's report was presented to the president on 21st October 2020. It was subsequently launched on 26th October 2020 at Bomas of Kenya in an, in an event presided over by the president. A third entity, the Building Bridges National Secretariat, whose origin is not clear to me, since I have not been able to trace on record any appointment letter or a Gazette notice, appears on the scene. So uh, co-chaired by Honorable Dennis Waweru, a, member, a former member of parliament for Dagoreti South constituency, and Honorable Junette Mohammed, a sitting member of the National Assembly representing the people of Sunna East. On 25th, November 2020 at the Kenyatta International Conference Center, the president launched the draft bill and rolled out the collection of signatures to support the initiative. A popular initiative 
for amendment of the Constitution according to Article 257 is commenced by the promoters getting at least 1 million registered voters to support it. It is the promoters who must formulate the draft bill. They are required thereafter to deliver the bill and supporting signatures to IBC. And from this point, the process is self-executing along the lines in Chapter 16. The term popular initiative has not been defined in the Constitution. But for the present purpose, the definition sources employed by both the High Court and the Court of Appeal are unanimous that the term popular initiative can only be an initiative by the general public. In common parlance, simply the people. The citizen who was described by Madan, Chief Justice in Gidunguri, as the man in the market, the man on Pangani bus. On the other hand, the word promoters in the Constitution is used only in Article 157. It is apparently a term of art in the context of amendment of the Constitution describing the persons not in the company law sense or in the colloquial sense, but those who initiate or champion constitutional changes. Beside the definition of the term popular initiative, there is history behind the process for the intendment of the framers. The CKRC final report 2005 acknowledged and recommended that apart from parliament, it was necessary for the people, in bracket citizens and civil society, in exercise of their constituent power to be involved in the constitutional, constitutional changes. The term popular initiative originated from this report. With that history in mind, there cannot be any de debate as to the target of Article 257. It is the people. The suggestion that Honorable Waweru and Honorable Mohammed, as co-chairpersons of the Secretariat and not the President, were the promoters cannot be accurate. First, the Secretariat emerged, as I've said, from the blues, as it were, for the first time in the process. However, Honorable Waweru himself, on behalf of himself and the co-chairperson, swore an affidavit of 5th February 2021 to state that the building bridges to a united Kenya was created and mandated with the task of initiating a constitutional amendment, process and unite, uni, unifying Kenyans, among other roles, that the task force and the secretariat conducted a robust nationwide public engagement and collection of views, and that from these views, it made various legislative policy and constitutional amendment proposals in various fields affecting Kenyans. So that although the Secretariat does not disclose its origin, its ancestry, its family tree, its gene cannot be conceived. The affidavit says it all. The great grandfather is the handshake. The, the grandfather is the task force. Its father is the steering committee. And the surname of all of them is Building Bridges Initiative, alias BBI. The bill which the Secretariat presented together with the signatures to the IEBC was clearly, so to speak, inherited from the steering committee, almost a replica of the bill annexed to the steering committee's report to the president. The draft bill was curiously signed by Building Bridges Initiative as the promoters, and not Honorable Waweru or Honorable Junet, or even the secretariat. It's not clear how they went about collecting the signatures, but on record, at least there is some evidence of state involvement, going by the letter written by the Principal Secretary, State Department for Sports, directing the Director General, Sports Kenya, to supervise the staff in the organization to complete the forms and sign appropriately and urgently 
the, uh, the forms. The conclusion I reach uh, should be apparent on the first limb of this ground is that the President, as a matter of fact, commenced and spearheaded the process from its inception and only passed on the baton to the two co-chairpersons when it was too late in the day and beyond recall that the President is ineligible to directly or indirectly initiate a constitutional amendment to the Constitution under any of the prescribed circumstances. That he cannot act as an, an ordinary citizen because he is not, and at the same time claim to be exercising executive authority. He cannot, in the circumstances of Chapter 16, run with the hare and hunt with the hounds. It has been argued that by barring the President from initiating the process of constitutional amendment, his right to equality and freedom from discrimination would be violated. The nature of violation has not been demonstrated. Looking at the facets of the rights and, of, and, of, and fundamental freedoms under Article 27, I cannot see any that could be breached by simply asking the President to stay on his lane of constitutional amendment process. Similarly, the guarantee of his political rights, which are specific under Article 38.1, that is to make political choices, to be registered as a voter, and to vote by secret ballot in any election or referendum, violated. The President's role in the constitutional review process has been preserved and is intact. The power to assent to a draft bill passed by Parliament and to request the IEBC to conduct a national referendum for approval of the bill are indispensable. Are indispensable roles and essential cogs in the process. Apart from this, the President, as indeed any other voter, is entitled to support a popular initiative by signing it, and in fact he did so in public. Indeed, nothing stops the President from campaigning for or against the initiative. For these reasons, I agree with the learned justices that to the extent that the President took certain steps and actions at the inception of the popular initiative process, as explained, the entire process was irredeemably flawed. I would, in the result, affirm the conclusion of the Court of Appeal. The third framed issue is on the second schedule to the draft bill. The number of cons constituencies today by dint of Article 89.1 stands at 290. The superior courts below were unanimous, and I am in agreement with them, that Article 89 is amendable in accordance with Chapter 16 to increase or even decrease the number of constituencies as proposed. The quarrel with the second schedule relates to paragraphs 1, 2, and 3 of the draft bill. After delimiting the constituencies for the National Assembly to 360, an additional 70 constituencies, the schedule sets out the manner and the period of review of the names and boundaries of those constituencies. This task, in terms of the Constitution is donated to the IBC, the period being at intervals of not less than eight years and not more than 12 years, but on condition that any review must be completed at least 12 months before a general election of members of parliament. Furthermore, if a general election is to be held within 12 months after the completion of a review, the new boundaries cannot be used in that election. The second schedule went against Article 89 and all that I've said. By providing only for a single criterion, the population quota, as the basis for delimitation, it went ahead and distributed the newly created 70 constituencies to specific counties, 
he directed the IBC to delimit the boundaries on the new constituencies on the single criterion. It ignored the irreducible constitutional consideration and the existing scientific criteria in Article 89. And finally, it ignored the principle of public participation. In view of the foregoing, the inescapable conclusion is that I'm in, respectfully, in respectful agreement with the learned justices of the, High, of the Court of Appeal that the second schedule to the bill was inconsistent with the Constitution, to which extent it was, a, it was correctly so declared. I would reject this ground of appeal. The fourth issue is on presidential immunity. In his petition, first 26 of 2020, Isaac Aluchir versus Uhuru Migai Kenyatta, Mr. Aluchir asked the court to determine whether the president can lawfully initiate a constitutional amendment through a popular initiative process, whether the president can establish a steering committee, and whether the steering committee had local standards to promote constitutional changes pursuant to Article 257. It also sought from the court to determine whether civil court proceedings can be instituted against the president during the tenure of office in respect of anything done or not done in excess of powers donated by the Constitution. Before us, while highlighting his submissions, Mr. Alocher complained that the two superior courts below made pronouncements that were wider than his original prayers, where he had only sought a declaration that the president had acted outside the functions of his office by unlawfully establishing the steering committee for which he ought to have been held liable. The Court of Appeal, having arrived at the conclusion that the President was not heard in his defense on allegations of breaching Chapter 6 of the Constitution, it was moot to consider whether the President was properly sued in his personal capacity, all the orders made against him in that capacity having been set aside. Consider, too, that both courts nullified the popular initiative on the ground that the president was not qualified qua president to initiate it, confirming that his actions, the Gazette notices, and so on, were official. Mr. Lochier's question was effectively answered, that no civil proceedings could be instituted against the president in his personal capacity in respect of his role in the proposed amendment. That would have been sufficient to conclude this ground. I cannot agree more uh, that the route taken by the High Court and the Court of Appeal in responding to Mr. Lucier's contention was respectfully slightly overboard. Their determination of the matter in the manner they did has, however, presented a chance to this Court to express itself directly on the question for the first time. And Article 131 of the Constitution, the people of Kenya acknowledge the, immense, the immensity and the enormity of the office and declared that the President shall not hold any other state or public office except that of the President. Again, because of the exacting nature of those responsibilities, the Constitution grants the President immunity to enable him or her to discharge the functions enumerated above with as much freedom, flex, flex, flexibility, and peace of mind as possible. Because the President's actions while in office are actions of the state and not personal, any person who is aggrieved by the exercise of state power by the President has a recourse, first to challenge the action in court by naming the Attorney General as a respondent in a judicial review application or a constitutional reference, or secondly, to institute civil action at the end of the president's tenure, because Article 143.3 holds the time from running 
for the wrongful actions committed while in office until the president leaves office. And of course, there is the option of impeachment motion, which may be moved in parliament against the president for engaging in gross violation of the constitution or of the law or committing a crime under national or international law or for gross misconduct. The Court of Appeal fell into error in the manner it construed Article 143 of the Constitution. And for these reasons, I would set aside the judgment of the Court of Appeal to the extent explained. The fifth issue was the place of public participation. The twin question before us are specific. The place of public participation under Article 10 in relation to the role of IBC under Article 257.4 of the Constitution, and whether there was public participation generally in respect of the draft bill. Public participation today is a constitutional imperative recognized as one of the principles of good governance and accountability. A reading of Article 257.4, the role of IBC is to verify the, that the initiative is supported by, by at least one million registered voters upon receipt of the draft bill and the one million signatures. I've already in the previous paragraph found in agreement with the two quotes in respect of the del delimitation of constituencies that there was no public participation. However, in respect of Article 257.4, the role of IVC does not extend beyond verification that the initiative is supported by, by at least one million registered voters without going behind the process to inquire if the promoters did conduct public participation. It is the duty of the promoters to carry out public participation before or as they collect signatures. On their own volition and initiative, the promoters make a proposal to amend the Constitution. They must persuade one million Kenyans to vote in support of their venture, to convince the assemblies and parliament about the prospects of the initiative, and ultimately Kenyans in a national referendum. It is the promoter's burden. Was there public participation by the promoters and later by the assemblies and parliament? According to the secretariat, according to the steering committee, both houses of parliament, some county assemblies, Honorable Odinga, there was public participation prior to and in the course of signature collection. Whether or not there was public participation is a matter of evidence. The burden of proof is always upon him who affirms and not on the one who denies. The burden was upon those who alleged that there was no public participation to prove that assertion. Not a single person was presented to support the statement and to rebut the evidence in support of public participation. In support of public participation at the two levels, that is the promoters on the one hand, county assemblies and parliament on the other, there was sufficient evidence. For these reasons, I would set aside the determination of the Court of Appeal on the question of public participation. The sixth issue is on the composition and quorum of IBC. And it is a common factor that IBC was not fully constituted when the bill and the signatures were presented to it. Not fully constituted in the sense that it did not have all its full, did not have its full complement. The vacancy started with the departure of Commissioner Akombe, who fled the country and announced her resignation while abroad on 18th October 2017. 16th April 2018, Commissioners Mwachanya, uh, Dr. Kibiwot Kurgat, and Consolata Nkatha, who was the Vice Chair, held a press conference at which they announced their immediate resignation. By a Gazette notice of 14th April 2021, the President formally declared the four vacancies. The vacancies were not filled until September 2021, nearly four years from the date of those resignations. 
and one month after the decision of the Court of Appeal in this very matter. Article 250 of the Constitution is what may be called a provision of general application for the reason that it applies to all the Chapter 15 uh, commissions. It declares that each commission shall consist of at least three um, members, but not more than nine. Section 5 of the IABC Act has fixed the membership at seven, the chairperson and six members. For the conduct and regulation of business and affairs of IABC, Section 8 of the Act refers to the second schedule, which at paragraph 5 provides for a quorum of five members. I've discussed in my main judgment the amendments in, the, in, 19, in 20, 2017 to this paragraph, how it was challenged in the case of Katiba um, and the decision of Muita Gay. I have also considered the effect of the decision in Isaiah Kibiwot and one case, considered too the CKRC report on the management of elections, the Hansard recording debate recording the debate on the election laws amendment bill 2017 have taken into consideration international best practices and borne in mind that IBC is a body corporate with perpetual succession the IBC whether fully constituted at seven members or with the minimum number of three is responsible for the formulation of policy and strategy as well as providing oversight. The secretariat and supporting units, directorates, divisions, and committees, being the professional and technical arm of the IBC, perform the day-to-day -day administrative functions of the commission and implement the policies and strategies formulated by the commissioners. It is therefore a contradiction of terms for the Court of Appeal and the High Court to say in the same breath that the IBC was properly constituted with three commissioners but lacked quorum to transact business and conduct its affairs. I arrived at the conclusion that with three commissioners, the IBC was properly constituted, quoted, and competent to carry out all its constitutional and statutory duties. In the result, I would set aside the conclusion by the Court of Appeal that the IBC lacked the necessary quorum to conduct any of its business under Article 257 of the Constitution. The final framed question is on the referendum question. Whether Article 257.10 of the Constitution requires that proposed amendments to the Constitution be submitted as separate and distinct referendum questions or question was raised by Mr. Murara. Again, the details of my analysis of this issue is contained in my judgment where I have explained in conclusion why I think the issue was premature. Noting that the draft bill had not been returned to the IBC from Parliament, IEBC had been restrained by an order of injunction from facilitating and submitting the draft bill to a referendum or taking any, any further action to advance it the nature of a question or questions to be framed by the IBC was not right. In the end, the Court of Appeal erred in failing to set aside the determination of the High Court on this issue for violating the doctrine of ripeness. I would set aside the majority decision of the Court of Appeal uh, to the effect that Article 257.10 of the Constitution requires the specific proposed amendments of the Constitution to be framed as question or questions. The details of what I've just rendered is in my main judgment. I thank you, Judge President. Uh, thank you, Justice Ohuko, for rendering your opinion. <clears throat> I will now call upon the Honorable Mr. Justice Renara to read his opinion. Thank you, Chief Justice, colleagues and counsel. 